In the midst of the console wars, as two tech giants were duking it out for the attention and wallets of any interested parties, their mascots were being thrown at just about anything that could make money. Sonic was making his way to the hearts and minds of people in any way that he could to try and outrun his plumber rival. Cartoons, cereal, various other forms of merchandise, this guy had made it. Of course, there was a direct sequel to the insanely popular Sonic the Hedgehog 2, but would you believe that there was also something of a secondary follow-up to Sonic 1 in development a while before Sonic 3 ever hit the shelves? Well, this all started because Yoshinaka, the lead programmer from the first game, didn't like the way Sega of Japan was bottlenecking his workflow and decided to work with a team in the States to get Sonic 2 made. Again, there's a whole other history lesson stemming from that. But back in Japan, Sega was getting ready to released the Sega CD, an attachment for the Sega Genesis that would allow the use of disc-based games for a whole new experience. Now, this wasn't the first system to use CDs for games. That honor actually went to the CD-ROM 2 system, a similar peripheral for the TurboGrafx-16, but this was nonetheless a really big deal that kind of served as a preview of where the industry would end up going. But of course, to help sell this system expansion, Sega wanted their golden boy ready to roll on the console, and so Nyoto Oshima, the character designer of Sonic, was tasked with directing a title which was originally meant to be a boosted up version of Sonic 2 that would take advantage of the new tech, but it evolved into a brand new experience all its own that remains one of the most unique titles in the franchise. So let's take some time to give this one a little attention today, a game that has become a little more divisive in recent years in the Sonic community, and one I didn't get to play through all the way until recent years. This is Sonic CD. So the first thing to tackle is how we're actually gonna be playing this game today, cause it's not on original hardware, I'll tell you that. I have had a really hard time tracking down an original Sega CD system and an even harder time finding one that works. These things have not held up well over the years and even if I did get my hands on one, getting clean footage from it would be something else entirely. I actually do have this loose disc here that I believe is from an old PC port of the game for the Dino or Dino OEM computers and I wouldn't even begin to know how to get one of these running so that makes two physical editions of this game that I own, but have no way of actually playing. Now, there was one more physical release for the game, sort of. In 2005, Sega released the Sonic Gems collection for the GameCube and PlayStation 2 in Japan and Europe, but in the States, we only got the GameCube release for some reason. Kind of like Sonic Mega Collection Plus, this is an archive of tons of older Sonic games from the days long past that were otherwise tough to track down, like Sonic the Fighters, this old arcade fighting game based on the Fighting Vipers engine, and Sonic R for the Sega Saturn, which... Oh boy, this uh, sure is a racing game. You had some other games, mostly Game Gear titles and stuff for the Genesis like Streets of Rage you can unlock, but the main draw of this little mini disc for me was Sonic CD. This game always came off as sort of elusive to me. It was harder to get a hold of than other classic titles, and I always just sort of saw it from afar with no real way of playing it. Sonic Gems Collection was not the easiest GameCube title for me to hunt down back in the day, and man, it sure ain't getting any easier. It was a fairly faithful port of the original game, but it did have some graphical and performance-based tweaks that made it a little easier to play for audiences at the time. Still, at least in the States, a pretty big deal breaker for some people was that it was based on the American port, which actually sported a different soundtrack than you would find elsewhere, and a lot of fans just were not a fan of that, but we'll get to the music later. So, this game was still pretty tough to experience outside of emulation, which I didn't really have the means or knowledge to do back in the day until finally, in 2011, we saw the mobile port. I mentioned the Christian Whitehead ports of Sonic 1 and 2 in the previous videos, but the whole trend got its start here, and what's even better is that while the other mobile ports are still exclusively available on that piece of plastic and glass you shove in your pocket, this version of Sonic CD was also ported to Steam, PS3, and Xbox 360, the latter of which is still accessible on newer Xbox systems as well. I do have the Steam version, a good way to play the game, but you might have to tweak it a little bit as the game's refresh rate is still really weird with Nvidia graphics cards and might just play way, way too fast. Is this how Sonic plays his games? I did finally get that running properly while working on this video, but recording playthroughs were done with the version that I used to finally play through this game properly after all these years, and that would be with the PlayStation 3. It really didn't waste any time getting my attention either, as it went to the trouble to clean up the opening video that was originally drawn by Toei Animation, and it's one of the best ways I've seen a game from this era open. Sonic himself is looking in top form here. To this day, this is my favorite design for the character. I don't think he's looked better before or since, though Sonic Mania does a great job capturing what I love so much about this look for the little blue dude. The way he runs, interacts with the environment, that 
attitude on his face and man, the music. Both versions, by the way. Between the American releases and other regions, we got two different songs ushering in this adventure and honestly, and you're not gonna hear me say this very many times, but I kinda prefer the American one here. Like, don't get me wrong, I love them both, but man, Sonic Boom just has a different kind of tone to it and it accompanies this piece of animation so well, I can't deny my love for this song. This flashy opening isn't just for show, it actually is helping set up the premise of the game. Dr. Robotnik is at it again, fiendishly plotting world conquest and domination, but this time he's not after the Chaos Emeralds. In Sonic's world, which they really need to just call Mobius already, there's a small world known as Little Planet that appears over Never Lake towards the end of every year. Eggman has chained down Little Planet to keep it from disappearing as it normally does, and has started using seven new MacGuffin rocks called the Time Stones to alter the flow of time itself and turn Little Planet into a grand fortress where he's using energy from the planet itself to power his newest badniks. Sonic sets out to put an end to this newest hard-boiled scheme, but he's followed by a young girl named Princess Sally. Rosie the Rascal. Amy Rose, a pink-haired hedgehog who has a very healthy crush on Sonic? Amy tries to keep up with the blue blur, but she soon runs into trouble with another newcomer and one of my favorite characters in the Sonic series. Sometimes you gotta fight fire with fire. Eggman has thrown all kinds of robotic badniks Sonic's way, but he's trumped every single one. So, if you can't overpower the hedgehog, you gotta aim for his speed. That's where Metal Sonic comes into play, a mechanical counterpart mimicking the look and abilities of our spiny hero who blasts in and takes off with Amy, determined to lead Sonic into a trap using the girl as bait. I love this guy. I love him so much. He's got this amazingly sleek but simple design, and it takes so many elements of what makes Sonic look cool and friendly and warps them into this cold, menacing presence. And this guy is still showing up in Sonic Media today. He's on the box art of this game no matter what region you're buying it from, and there was even an anime OVA featuring this guy as a major focus of rivalry for Sonic, long before there was any kind of big budget live action adaptations for this franchise. They knew what they had going on here, and I'm really glad they leaned into this guy as hard as they did. He's built up to be this main antagonist almost as much as Robotnik himself. But Sonic can't take him head on straight away. He's got a bit of a struggle ahead of him, and he's gonna have to tackle these obstacles in a whole new way. We start off in Palm Tree Panic, basically the newest flavor of Green Hill Zone, but this one is definitely taking advantage of that more beefed up hardware. The basic loop has been turned into this giant showcase of 3D style graphics, and more importantly, we're introduced to the main gimmick of the game. This is kind of the make it or break it mechanic of Sonic CD. You know, I guess it wasn't enough to be borrowing elements from Dragon Ball and Star Wars. Now Sonic was about to tap into a whole different kind of adventure. And considering this game was centering around Eggman manipulating time, I'll give you three guesses as to which major film franchise Sonic was taking inspiration from this time. There are seven levels in this game, each with three zones. I kind of liked when the levels themselves were referred to as zones and the segments were all acts, but whatever, this is a one-time thing. Within every zone, you'll see these past and future signs, and by touching one, you'll need to speed up and maintain that momentum for a long enough period of time to travel to either the past or future of whatever area you're in, depending on the sign that you activated. If you travel to the future, you'll see a dark and twisted version of the location you were just in, showing the danger of what Eggman will bring to this place if he succeeds in taking over Little planet. But travel to the past and you'll see this location in a more primitive and natural state where you can prevent that bad future from coming true by finding and destroying Eggman's robot generators he set up in that earlier time period. And yeah, I know there's also the projectors, I'll be getting to those in a minute. Now in terms of movement and control, everything here is going to feel very similar to Sonic 1 and 2, though the earlier versions of this game had a much worse version of the spin dash that's really missing the takeoff speed and feels all but useless. Thankfully this was rectified with the HD versions, though you do have the the option to switch back to the Sega CD spin dash if you're unwell in the head. New to the table is the Super Peel Out. By standing still and holding up on the D-pad, Sonic will start revving up kind of like the spin dash, but now he's standing up with his feet moving so fast that they create this little figure eight shape. Seriously, how cool is that? He has no offense with this like he does with the spin dash, so it's up to you to determine if you want a bit of a speed boost with the ability to destroy oncoming obstacles, or if you want to move a bit faster but leave yourself vulnerable. It's a nice little risk and reward system, but I don't think it was really all 
all that well thought out until the spin dash was made more useful in later versions. Uh, before, it was just kind of there in the old port. Now, finding a place to speed yourself up in time travel can take several different forms. The most obvious might be finding a clear path straight ahead that will let you run without stopping, but those are few and far between, so it falls on you to find the different gimmicks of each level that might otherwise be environmental hazards or obstacles, and utilize them as tools to help you gain and maintain speed. There were a lot of times I passed by something, only to return to it once I needed to go back to the past, and it never got old. It was always this great moment of realization, as I was making the stage work for me, other than just trying to get through it. And that's the thing, if you're playing the game this this way, and that is important if you're playing the game this way, you're gonna find yourself with a very, very different experience than you would get from other Sonic titles that came before, or even those that have come since. Your mission is no longer just to get to the end of the stage really fast, now you need to find a way to warp to the past, find the generator, take it out, and then make your way to the end. Once destroyed, these won't be able to propagate the badniks inhabiting the area and all of them will start to disappear, making the habitat safe again. Now, after all that belly aching in Sonic 2 about how much slower hunting down the Chaos Emeralds made the game, I had to ask myself, why do I like the pacing so much more here? I think it's partially because, well, these stages are built for it. In fact, most stages have their generators parked pretty close to places you'll find yourself warping into the past anyway, but there's still a merit to going through these levels and finding the most straightforward route that will let you take these things out. I do understand the criticism of what this does to the game's pacing, and I don't want to sound too hypocritical after that lecture I gave Sonic 2. I mean, this is Sonic we're talking about here, and it's only natural that players are going to want to go fast when playing him, but the way that all of this is set up and builds on the exploration elements from previous games, rewarding that skill to memorize and strategize around the best routes for each zone and even just the way time travel is activated, I don't know, this still feels like something that's taking advantage of Sonic's unique qualities. His playstyle is exactly the one I would want for a game like this. Yeah, it slows the game down, but the payoff that comes with this platforming exploration really does feel worth it. If you go through the first two zones without destroying any generators, even if you just miss one, the third zone, which is usually a rather short, mostly containing a fight with Robotnik, will be set in the bad future, meaning you'll have to keep moving forward knowing that you failed to save this area. But man, destroy all those generators and then make it to Zone 3 and you'll be greeted with a good future. Everything here is so alive and vibrant, the music is cranked up to these amazing, upbeat versions of that level's theme. It feels like a celebration, one that the game continues to offer you every time you go out of your way for these things. The game wants you to feel rewarded, it knows you're doing things the hard way, and it wants to tell you that the effort was worth it. Well, sometimes more than others. For the most part, the generator hunt is really well handled if you're down for the pacing, and while some stages like Tidal Tempest will probably move a little slower than some people are comfortable with, the only stage I think is just straight up handled poorly is Wacky Workbench. This place's little gimmick of the bouncing floor is fine and all during a more speed-oriented run, but for time travel, it's a chore. Pulling off time travel is a little trickier here than in other stages for one thing, and I guess it's not too bad in Zone 2, just kind of silly how many times you pass this generator before you can actually destroy it, but the generator in Zone 1 is bad. It's just bad. There's no communication here. I found this by total accident, by way of something that should have killed me. Get smushed by one of these pillars in any other place in the game, and it's an instant death, but here it's your only means of accessing this generator. That's probably the biggest issue with the time travel. That one generator right there, but it's not the only thing in the game that could have been a little less, you know, a little less stupid. Everyone talks about this spike trap that can kill you outright at the beginning of Collision Chaos Zone. Hey, thanks for playing your game, now die! And while I love Stardust Speedway, I really do, I don't think the lane switching is very well communicated here. Took me a bit to figure out that you have to hit these blue switches to basically change the lanes of the path that you're traveling on because while you do see these paths crisscrossing over each other, there is no visual indicator as to which path is actually open to you. I mean, you'd think with how well the treadmills and quartz quadrant were handled, this wouldn't really be much of a problem. Back to the time travel though, there are also these little hologram projectors showing Metal Sonic lording over the animals of the environment and bullying them into submission. Just like the generators, you'll have one of these in zone 1 and 2 of every stage, all in the past. The final stage is an exception, as those zones do contain generators, but they do not have any projectors. Taking one of these out will cause the wildlife in that area to come out of hiding and fill the stage, and that's it. Now, I don't know if something changed between this version of the game and the original, but these projectors are not required for security 
ensuring a good future for the end of zones. It's a cosmetic change and nothing else. And it's not like the game really communicates this to you outside of the fact that finishing a zone after destroying a generator but leaving the projector alone still results in a good future. Oh, I'm sorry. In the HD version, if you destroy every generator and projector in every zone during a single playthrough, you'll get a trophy or achievement. And I struggle to think of anything more worthless. And it doesn't help that these can be more of a hassle to track down than the generators at times. Like this one in zone two of Quartz Quadrant, man, just gotta hide this all the way back at the beginning of the zone in a pretty easy to miss spot. Okay, yeah, yeah, thanks game. There are flaws to the time travel mechanic. I mean, you could always just go back and blast through the game, get the bad ending like you might for the other titles. You free Little Planet and stick it to Eggman, but he's still got those time stones and is able to set his plans up again because of it, and it's a temporary victory. But it kind of goes back to what I was saying in Sonic 2 about the game essentially punishing you for trying to meet it on its terms, but Sonic CD makes up for that in a couple of ways. Again, doing all this basically transforms the game around you. You're constantly being rewarded for your effort. But Sonic CD has other options. Not feeling the whole time travel scavenger hunt, but still want that more satisfying ending? This game's got you covered, but you are still gonna have to put a little work in. Special stages are here once again, but the Chaos Emeralds are absent. In their stead are the seven Time Stones, and you gain access to them in a very similar way to Sonic 1. Grab 50 rings and make it to the end of the stage. Jump into the Warp Ring, and you're in. The stages themselves are actually a lot of fun, too. More so on the HD version, I feel like the sense of depth is a little lost in the original, and it makes it a lot harder, but on more modern hardware, it's a lot more manageable. You have to run around this plane to jump and destroy these little UFOs. Some will give you rings. If you collect enough of those, you'll get a continue. Some will speed you up, but you have to destroy all of them to succeed. They all have these set patterns to move around in, but the challenge comes in with the water around the environment. You have a limited amount of time to get this done, and about every step you take in the water knocks down 10 seconds from your timer, adding to the tension. Now, once your timer's down to about 20 seconds, a special UFO will appear that will grant you more time if you destroy it. So, this ends up being a very challenging special stage at times, but it's one that's fairly manageable and rewards you for your skill and adaptability. This is probably one of my favorite types of special stage in the series now. After completing each special stage, you'll be awarded a time stone, and once you have all seven, the rest of the game is just open to you. You've just gathered artifacts that will let you control the timeline, and now you just have to reach the end of each level, and Zone 3 will always be set in the good future. Unless you're destroying the generators along the way, you'll miss seeing some of the good futures in several areas, but it almost helps to see firsthand the consequences of your failure before feeling the relief after collecting the stones and knowing that you've got the good future in the bag. And man, it's one of those things that makes the music stand out so much more. Every level has four forms, past, present, good future, and bad future, and they all have their own versions for that level's main song. The atmosphere they bring is unreal. I cannot get over how amazing the Japanese version of present title Tempest is. The tone here is unmatched. And that catchy beat in Quartz Quadrant, Stardust Speedways theme, you know what, all of it. I love this entire soundtrack. It is all gold and it elevates the rest of the games it's attached to by so much. Now, I am referring mostly to the Japanese stuff here, but the American OST is good too. I think people are way too quick to write this stuff off. It's got that great early 90s vibe that I live for from video games of this era, and I think that they do a good job of matching the tone of each level, but if I really had to choose just one, I'd go with the original Japanese soundtrack. I like the localized OST, but I also like every track from the Japanese equivalent more. Uh, two exceptions, actually. I like Sonic Boom a lot, like I said earlier, but I also think the theme for the Eggman bosses is just way better than the American soundtrack. Like, it actually feels menacing and evil versus, well, I don't know what they were going for in the original soundtrack, but I guess whatever that is. Probably good to bring that up though, Robotnik is in this game after all, and I actually like these fights with him quite a lot. They are really easy, like maybe too easy. If you know what you're doing, you can even grab some power-ups before the couple of these fights that trivialize them entirely, but they make up for it with sheer creativity. Like I love how well the main hazards from each level are reincorporated here into these unique fights. The treadmill fight with Eggman where you have to run and burn out the bottom of his platform is just hilarious, and I always gotta give props to a good pinball-based battle. 
Pinball. Actually, we've seen pinball-related stuff come up with Sonic a few times now. I mean, he curls into a ball, the flippers knock him around a bit. You know, if they really leaned into this and flesh out a good table, they could probably make a decent pinball game based on the character. Yeah, yeah, I can see that going well. And yes, this final boss with Robotnik is the easiest one yet, almost to the point of being anticlimactic. You can jump in here with rings and everything. It's like the developers wanted Sonic to live or something. Ah, eh, that's fine by me though. The best fight is the one just prior and it's against Robotnik, but also your tin-plated rival, Metal Sonic. It's actually more of a race than a fight, too, trying to beat Metal to the end of the track while avoiding taking damage from him, Eggman, or Spikes on the ground, and I am bad at this fight. Like, really bad, but man, is it just so much fun. Beat him to the finish and rescue Amy, and the final level doesn't even have any Metal Sonic projectors, mostly just because he isn't a threat anymore. I guess that's a kind of decent attention to detail. And somehow, Amy is able to keep up enough during that final stage, as when you deal the final blow to Dr. Robotnik, she runs up to Sonic, who rockets her out of the exploding base, and look at that, just trying to make sure that she's okay before running off to check on Eggman. Oh, this game is precious. Based on the way that you played, you'll either see Eggman begin his plans anew with the Time Stones, or see Little Planet break free from the Tyrant's grasp and disappear, granting new life to Sonic's home planet. Almost like it's leaving behind a sign of gratitude before flying off to wherever it belongs. And you know what? All of my gratitude to this little game right here. I thought I'd gain a new appreciation for Sonic 1 after reviewing it, but this is on a different level entirely. There is a spirit to Sonic CD, a heart. I see it in those wonderful animations bookending the adventure, a style I was so happy to see used again for the Sonic OVA. Seriously, I cannot get enough of this tone for Sonic. I feel it in the music that plays, more so in one soundtrack, but both have well-earned places here. And playing this game just brings a smile to my face. I started Palm Tree Panic as Tales just to show that, yeah, the HD version does make him playable, just excluding references to Amy or really any cutscenes at all. And while I just meant to get footage of this first zone, I couldn't stop myself from just playing through the entire game again. It's so much fun, and I think it brings quality to the table no matter how you play it. Like, if you're just here for a speedy adventure, yeah, Title Tempest and Metallic Madness will slow down your progression a little bit, but that speedy, reaction-based platforming is here and it's in full swing. I do not understand people who pretend otherwise. Even now, as I'm finishing this script, I just want to keep playing the game. I want to beat my records on time attack mode. I want to see if I can do a fast generator run. I just don't want to put it down. Man, I'm glad I played this. I can totally understand why people are more mixed on this one. The way levels are laid out can feel super alienating at first, but please don't be scared away from giving this game a shot or maybe just trying it out again. What you'll find here is one of the best side-scrolling platformers I've ever touched, and one that I'll keep finding new excuses to experience again. Be it on your phone, on your PC, one of your home consoles, or in the upcoming Origins collection, assuming Sega will ever actually release the thing, I can't recommend enough that you try out this game for yourself and maybe you'll find a new favorite title in the series like I did. You owe it to yourself to at least try out this experimental little bundle of joy that is Sonic CD. I really did end up loving this game a lot more than I thought I was going to, and I try not to be blind to its flaws, I pointed them out where I could but it ended up being really difficult to talk negatively about Sonic CD. It might actually be a contender for my favorite game in the classic lineup, but that does still need to be tested. But that does mean that we gotta talk about the big one next time, right? I mean, especially with a new movie coming out and everything? It might finally be time to take a look at Sonic Spinball. But until then, remember that my top tier patrons get to see these videos two days early. You can find me on Twitter, Twitch, Discord, Sunset City, whichever you prefer. Links in the description. And of course, as always, spread the word, tell your friends, and until we see each other again, thank you so much for watching. See you next mission. Hey there everyone, thanks for watching. You know, this was one of those times when I was working on the script and I'm looking at the page count and I'm just seeing it building and building and I'm just sitting there, well, I did it again. I made this video a lot longer than I meant to, but I have no regrets. I really did just have an absolute blast with this one and I think it deserved to be talked about and uh, I, I will never apologize for just gushing over something that I love. Of course, you saw the end there, uh, Sonic 3 and Knuckles. I do have planned to release alongside the movie, if not on the day like I was I was originally hoping. Uh, it's at least going to be around that time period, but before we get there, 
Ah, come on, April 1st is coming up. We gotta have ourselves a little bit of fun. So we are gonna be taking a short look at Sonic Spinball. Not gonna be a complicated video. It's not gonna, be, you know, there's only so much to say about that game to begin with. It's probably gonna be somewhere between 10, 15 minutes long, but I'm hoping that you guys enjoy it all the same. With all of that said, uh, man, I could not do any of this, of course, as I say every time, Without you, my wonderful supporters, viewers, Patreon supporters, everybody, and I have to give a very special shout out to my current top tier patrons this month. They are Brendan Hess, Christine Larkin, Earl Valco, Jeremiah Harrison, Lederick, McKenzel, Mr. SP, Wanton Photo, Nicholas Morgan, Patricia Marcou, and Cyrus the Skeptic. Thank you each and every one of you. I love you all. I wouldn't be able to get to do any of this without you, and I'm going to continue to work on this. I'm getting this whole new drive to just like, I really want to be able to do this full time one day. And, uh, it, you know, maybe someday we'll actually get there. But I wouldn't be able to uh, make that a reality at any point if it wasn't for your support. So thank you once again. I'm going to go ahead and get back to work and I will see you next mission.